Hello to my fellow Torontonians and transit enthusiasts. Today on another episode of Tales of Toronto Transit, we have with us a special guest. Here he is to talk about how he helped save Toronto streetcars from extinction. I'm Steve Monroe. I go by various titles, but transit advocate will do. Sometimes rail fan, uh, lover of Toronto politics and history. And I'm here to talk about Streetcars for Toronto Committee and how Toronto still has streetcars. Welcome to Tales of Toronto Transit. So, Steve, do you remember when your interest in transit first began? Well, there's a difference between being interested in transit and being interested in streetcars and trains. Uh, when I was a wee kitty, I had a great love of streetcars and trains, and actually uh, my dad and I would, West Toronto Station, which used to be not very far away from here, uh, we used to come out and watch the trains because uh, our family originally was in the West End uh, near Davenport and uh, Delverport, so this was local for us. That one? That one, yes. Well, that, they had the, wet, the CPR station and, of course, the little CN station up the road, mm -hmm. which lasted longer, but wasn't anywhere near as grand. So there was an interest in trains but also particularly an interest in streetcars and we moved up to Mount Pleasant and Eglinton when I was quite young and I lived at the end of what was then the St. Clair car line at Mount Pleasant and Eglinton and would go and sit in the loop and watch the streetcars come and go. And we'd also uh, go on weekend trips around the city so I actually when I was quite young got to know the old city of Toronto well because we would go on a different streetcar line and there were a lot more of them then uh, so, you know, here I am, a kid of like seven or eight, and I, I really know my way around Toronto quite well, which I know was unusual. But, but that's, so that was, that was part of the context, and of course with all streetcars, and I like streetcars, so that's, that's what it started out as. What it evolved into was an interest, okay, streetcars are nice, but, you know, we don't just keep them because they're nice, mm -hmm. we keep them because they do something in the transit system, and that's how I kind of did the migration into the political side of, you know, what do you need to make a good transit system? Uh, how do you, uh, how you, how do you approach, first, first of all, the problem of establishing why you need them mm -hmm. and what could they do more than they did at the time in the early 70s when the fight to save the streetcars came up. Tell us about your role in the Streetcars for Toronto Committee. Uh, streetcars for Toronto was formed in 1972 because the TTC was planning that was they were then going to start a gradual dismantling of what was left of the streetcar system heading to 1980 when drumroll the Queen Street subway would open. Uh, now I don't know whether you've ridden the subway on Queen Street recently the service isn't too good it's very short there's a very little piece of tunnel that basically goes from the east side of young street to the west side of young street under queen station and that's all of the queen street subway that was ever built mm -hmm. um so the the, pro the the problem was twofold one was that quite clearly the replacement major trunk line downtown was not going to occur but also the ttc's proposal the first line to go was going to be st Clair. never mind that it was my home line but it was st Clair was going to go first and they were, they were at a point where the, because the Young Subway had just opened to York Mills, mm -hmm. the trolley buses that were running on Young Street north of Eglinton came off and they said, well, let's put these on St. Clair. The only problem was there was nowhere near enough of them to replace the capacity of the streetcar line. And this seemed to be the pattern they were going to head into of saying, oh yeah, we can replace streetcar service, but not putting on as good replacement bus service. Never mind whether it's an electric bus or a diesel bus, not putting on as good service as what had been there before. And the Sinclair line was a very busy streetcar line. Uh, it ran uh, until the Bloor subway opened. There was a one-minute service on Sinclair between mm -hmm. Young and Oakwood, and then the Rogers Road car branched off there. But so, I mean, St. Clair was a very, very busy route, and the idea of cutting service on it was just like, are you kidding? And you kind of project that out over the rest of the streetcar system. Yeah. So that was, that was the one piece. The other piece was that the, the international interest in what's called light rapid transit or light rail transit, which was a term that was coined, frankly, to try to, to beautify the name streetcar. I mean, the transit industry kind of flailed around because streetcars are old-fashioned you know, we're all getting rid of streetcars mm -hmm. well yes but streetcars as light rapid transit are modern mm -hmm. um, 
So the, the idea that you could use a vehicle that wasn't a subway car, that didn't have to run uh, completely separate from traffic, I mean, you don't necessarily you don't have to you don't have to run in traffic, mm -hmm. but the point is that w there are cases where there's not enough service on a line to warrant full grade separation. So you can have things like level crossings that intersect. Even if you are on a private right of way, you can cross intersecting streets at grade. Yeah. Uh, or you can run in the middle of a street uh, like Spadina or Harbor Front or St. Clair. Uh, so basically, that those were the kinds of models we were looking at. And that's, that's what got Streetcars for Toronto, Toronto Committee started. Uh, I was not originally the head of it. The guy who, who headed Streetcars for Toronto at its founding uh, was named Andy Beemler, and he was, uh, he was a professor of child psychology at the University of Toronto. Okay. Just to show, it, it yeah. was a really varied bunch that, that mm -hmm. were, were involved. Uh, Mike Filey, who I'm sure you know, has a weekly column in The Sun, who's a Toronto historian. He was one of our numbers. Uh, there were various other people, some of whom I have completely lost track of. They just vanished over the years. Another one was Howard Levine, who was for a time a member of city council. And actually, that's kind of the bookend mm -hmm. because Streetcars for Toronto continued to operate even after we'd saved the streetcar system working on other projects. Mm -hmm. And then um, Howard got elected to council. At that point, okay, you either wear a council hat or you're a neighborhood activist. So, so that was... That was the point at which you said, okay, Streetcars for Toronto really doesn't need to exist anymore because it had, it had dwindled down to fewer and fewer people anyway. If Streetcars for Toronto didn't succeed in their mission, what do you imagine the modern TTC might be like? You'd have lots of buses. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, that's the first important thing. You'd have lots of buses. Um, and... People who complain, for example, about all oh, the streetcars in on King Street and Dundas Street, you know, Rob Ford just hated driving in on Dundas Street to City Hall because the streetcars got in his way. Well, just yeah. imagine how many more buses there would be yes. to carry the people the streetcars are carrying today. Um, that's, that's one obvious change that would have occurred. Um, but the, the other one, and this is a little harder to get a handle on, but I do know that when Toronto made the decision to keep its streetcars, that was one of the factors. Uh, Edmonton, Alberta had been looking at light rail. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we made that decision was one of the contributing factors for Edmonton saying, hey, Toronto's keeping their streetcars. Maybe this is, you know, this is a pretty decent idea. Mm -hmm. Edmonton built their line. It was very successful. Calgary copied them. And Calgary's now got a large LRT network. Um, other systems in the U.S. The San Diego trolley was one of the first of the modern systems. Interestingly, Edmonton, Calgary, and San Diego all had the same equipment because mm -hmm. they kind of copied each other. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to take credit single-handedly for a renaissance of light rail because I think it would have happened, but it would have taken a lot longer mm -hmm. because it needed the, the impetus of a city that had a reputation for having a very good transit system, which Toronto had, mm -hmm. and the fact that the provincial government had decided that transit was important, uh, that was there. So other cities said, hmm, there's, there might be something to this. Mm -hmm. And we've now seen a light rail renaissance, which I think would have happened eventually, but it would have not taken off as quickly without, without us as an example. Well. I think another obvious difference is that we would not have the CLRV streetcars that we are all used to. Yeah, so we'll see. This is an interesting vehicle, how this came to be. Mm -hmm. Because what happened was the province was working on their new technology train that eventually became the RT. But that, the original version of that ran into all manner of technical problems. They were going to build a demonstration track at the CNE. Of course. All of that that was ever built was four foundations for elevated, like piers for the elevated structure, and they, they cut down a small forest that was near the Princess Gates because that's where the station was going to be. Mm -hmm. That's the, all of that that was ever wow. built. Um, and they were coming into the 80s with now nothing to show for their efforts for about eight years. Mm -hmm. So everybody keeps saying, light rail, light rail, light rail, and they glommed on to the designs that the TTC had been working on in the 60s mm -hmm. and said, okay, let's build some streetcars. But again, in the typical 
you know, provincial overkill, they said, oh, but these are for suburban lines. They have to be high-speed cars. Mm -hmm. So the design, these cars, well, obviously not this model sitting here, but the car that it is the model for, is actually capable of 70 mile an hour operation. Wow. Were there ever any thoughts of fighting to keep the trolley buses around? As a matter of fact, we did, and we were involved in that. Um, the Bay Street bus was electrified for a time, um, and that was due to our efforts to say, look, you know, you've got these trolley buses, you should use them. And it was, there were studies of actually expanding the trolley bus network. Uh, it ran aground for a couple of reasons. One was that the, the old trolley bus network in Toronto um, what Annette Street was a trolley bus line, mm -hmm. uh, so was Keel Street, the Western Road bus. Um, w the trolley bus network largely served the old industrial area in the near West End. So the Ossington bus that went down uh, down to Queen uh, and then and King, down to the Massey Massey Ferguson plants and Inglis, mm -hmm. all all the all the industry that used to be along King Street West, where it's now condos. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ossington, Lansdowne. Uh, the bus up on the junction was fairly recent because that was, while it became a trolley bus, that wasn't until 1966 because mm -hmm. it was a streetcar until 1966. Yes. Annette, as I say, because it was all the industry around, along the, the railway corridor, so Annette was, but the Annette bus originally only went over to Christie Street and then it was extended, replacing the DuPont streetcar, where that was when it was extended to St. George Station as the DuPont 26 bus runs today. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the Bay bus, we got the bay bus converted to trolley bus, and actually the TTC bought some used trolley buses from Edmonton, mm. because Edmonton was doing an update, and we got secondhand buses from them. So they ran, and they actually ran in Edmonton colors oh, really? in Toronto. Um, I guess they were actually technically leases rather than than purchases, because if they'd been purchases, we would have repainted them. That's least. fair. Yeah. But so there were Edmonton buses running around on on the Toronto streets. Um, the big challenge became if you're going to expand the trolley bus system, which routes to do it on. Mm -hmm. the, the ideal routes as a first cut, first of all, would be in the West End to build off the existing system. But you get into routes like Keel, Dufferin, Bathurst, Jane. They had some nice hills, which is great for electric operation, but they also run into a couple of problems. One is that they go outside of what was then the city of Toronto, wow. pre amalgamation yeah. city of Toronto. And you had to convince the good burgers of York and North York that they wanted trolley buses in their mm. territory. Uh, Dufferin would have been an ideal line because it went all the way down uh, to the exhibition grounds at the south end. But there was a problem at the north end, and there still is a problem, um, where, the, where the Dufferin bus jogs along Wilson to go into Wilson Station um, is basically along the south side of Downs Hill Airfield and you can't string electrical wires along Wilson Avenue because there's an air base there. Yes, and yeah, they, that makes sense. You know, so that was, a, that was an issue. So it was one of these things where it sounds nice in theory, but there were, we kept running into problems. Now, having said that, there was actually a tactical advantage in fighting that fight because it happened to overlap uh, the period when the Scarborough RT technology had reappeared and Scarborough RT was built, and there was sort of, well, what do we need these streetcars for anyway? So um, having, basically the trolley bus fight, even though we didn't manage to save the trolley buses, in effect became kind of a, a straw battle for the streetcars because it was fighting to keep electrification. Mm -hmm. But if we lost it, it wasn't the end of the world. I mean, I hate to yeah. say that for all the fans of trolley buses, yeah. but if we had to lose something this better the trolley bus system than the streetcar system. Why do we as a city give so little priority to speeding up our streetcar lines, even though they carry more people than the entire GO train network? Is it because people are just too exhausted and busy to do transit advocacy and think nothing can change? It's a little more complicated than that. Okay. Um, the first point, without question, Toronto likes to think of itself as a transit city, but it is still very much dominated by car-oriented thinking. Mm -hmm. 
we're spending half a billion dollars so that Denzel Min and Wong can drive downtown down the Don Valley Parkway and around the corner onto the Gardner two or three minutes faster than he might have if the guard, East Gardner was demolished and made an at-grade road. Mm -hmm. So this is still a city that is terrified and terrified on behalf of suburban motorists who you have to remember people in the suburbs have a very different way of looking at transit than people mm -hmm. downtown. In a lot of cases, they don't have a choice. Now, if you're going to drive downtown, yeah, you've got a choice. But the, the problem is the mentality dominates council. Mm -hmm. And so you've got a situation where um, the minute you start talking about taking away road space and road capacity from motorists, the, the world is going to end. Yeah. Now, uh, I mean, we had a situation actually a few years ago, that would be about six years back, where there was a proposal to remove some parking spaces on Dundas Street to increase speed for streetcars at certain times of the day. Well, the local businesses went absolutely ballistic. Yes. Now, having said that, part of the reason they went absolutely ballistic was that the proposal was something of overkill because they were going to lose a lot of parking spaces and over an extended period of the day well into the evening. Mm -hmm when frankly there isn't enough traffic on Dundas Street to worry about whether there's parking spaces or not. Yeah. So one of the issues in, in the whole debate about you know, how you carve up the space and time on, on roadways is a function of, uh, you know, you can't have everything. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna have, I don't know whether you want to break till you know, whatever is going on out there. I think it won't pick it up on that. Okay. One of the big problems about, about transit priority is you have to decide how you're going to carve up road space and time because we know there isn't enough to go around. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of parking is a quick and dirty fix that buys you some capacity in places where the parking really doesn't serve a function for all, you know, it's a convenience for the handful of people who can park in those 10 parking spaces, yeah. but the, the community isn't going to collapse because the parking goes away. Mm -hmm. Fine. That's, that's the easy ones. Um, the trickier ones become when you start saying, okay, let's just not let motorists on this street at all. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, there's a proposal floating around right now uh, of making King Street a transit mall. Or... You know, to some degree or another, kicking the motorists off of King Street. Yeah. Well, as a simple example, when this proposal first, sh and this is this has been around now for five or six years at least, because it, it it predates the Rob Ford era. You know, back when we could still talk about taking over road space. Yeah. Um, the when it was first proposed, King Street west of University over to Bathurst. The condos that have now started to be built, like around King and Spadina, weren't there yet. Mm. A lot of the traffic congestion around King and Spadina, there's a combination of road traffic and pedestrian traffic, wasn't there because it was still just the old industrial buildings along King West. Same as you go further further west along King. I mean, some of that's older than than you know the last say last half decade, but King Street as a street is changing from a street that was light office and industrial 20 years ago mm -hmm. to a very residential street, which changes the nature of traffic, the nature, we've got more pedestrian traffic out there. And so, uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons the King Car is so busy is yeah. there's so many people living on that, on that line. And actually the King Car is unique among the surviving streetcar lines in that its ridership today is as good as or better than it was 50 years ago when the Bloor subway opened. Yeah. There are other streetcar lines that have lost a lot of their service, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Part of that's demographics, part of it's where areas that, that had a lot of employment that no longer have, you know, it's become, an, it's become residential rather than industrial, which changes the, the nature of the commuting, or it's reoriented, or people are more affluent. So, the, uh, you know, the beach is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, the beach was always a fairly tony part of town, but not as tony as it is today. Mm -hmm. So uh, you had a much higher 
commuting pattern on the streetcar lines out of the beach, like the Queen and the Kingston Road services, had very, very frequent service that I think if you put that kind of service out there today, they'd think, you know, they'd died and gone to heaven. They couldn't believe there'd be so many streetcars on the street. Yeah. Um, but that was because you had um, more larger families living in those houses, as opposed to houses that have been taken over, rent out, and you got like two or three people living in a great big house. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people out there who drive, and a lot of people who live out there no longer work downtown, because they now drive to suburban jobs, north and east into Scarborough, rather than the jobs all being clustered in downtown Toronto. So it changes the characteristic of the demand on the car lines. So King Street, by contrast, has become the street that has all the housing that all the people who want to live downtown close to the jobs downtown are yeah. in. Yeah. So King Street has perpetuated the land use and the travel pattern that predate the Bloor Danford subway and the big expansion of suburban housing, but that hasn't happened to the same degree on the other car lines. It's going to start to happen. And one of the, one of the important things over the next, I mean, it's funny, this was something, talking about streetcars for Toronto, which was something we thought about in the 70s, was, okay, the city is going to become more dense, mm -hmm. and you're going to need the capacity of the streetcar lines to handle that traffic. And ironically, what happened was that the, the demand fell, and particularly there was a big drop in the recession in the early 1990s. And, and in some cases, the, the system never recovered to the same level of, of what it had been. But now when you look at what the development patterns and where, where new buildings are being built, it's all infill along the streetcar corridors. And the streetcar system is going to become more important proportionately than it is now as it pick, starts to, you know, you take the slack back out of the system and say, oh, we've got to put more streetcars here. And it's something the TTC is aware of, that they're actually looking, they have to expand their new streetcar order beyond what it is now because they're looking out into the 2020s and saying, yeah. okay, you know, because if you look at all the development applications in the city and where they are, yeah. they're all central city along the streetcar lines out to sort of like Dufferin-ish in the west and over to Broadview yeah. and a bit further east. And actually there's some further east from Broadview. But it, all the traffic all is going to build up again along the east-west car lines into mm -hmm. downtown. And having those car lines there is very important. So, I mean, I can sort of say, yes, it's, we, could, we could pretend... Look how far-sighted we were back in 1972. <laughs> yeah. We didn't think it was going to take this long for the system to really prove its worth, but it's a good thing we still have it. Mm -hmm. It's funny to say, so we're going to need more flexities than we've already ordered, and we're still already having trouble even getting those. Yes, we're, I, I, I really am hoping that Bombardier will manage to get up to the four cars a month they claim they're going to get up to by yeah. the end of this month. We had 4017 was the last car, and I'm sort of wondering where is 4018? We haven't had any deliveries for a few weeks, so. Nice. So it's, I mean, they, they work. When they work, they're marvelous. Yes. But just, can you please get them here? <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm sure you're not the only one that feels that way. Yeah. Well, you see, one of the things that, that hurt the streetcar system's capacity was that, I, mean, I talked about the early 90s recession. Mm -hmm. So because of that recession, by 1997, when the Spadina streetcar opened, the TTC had extra streetcars. So that's how they were able to open a whole new line yeah. without buying any cars. Oh. But those extra cars were basically cars that had become surplus because of service cuts during the early 90s. And then they didn't have cars to put the service back as the riding went up. Oh. And it's the reason the streetcar system for two decades has been constrained on how much service it can provide mm -hmm. because there were no spare car. Well, I think that is all we have time for today. Thank you, Steve, for taking the time to answer my questions, and I will see you, the viewers at home, next time.